Since time immemorial, Okinawa was an independent nation known as Luchu, with a vibrant past as a center of trade, finance, and cultural exchange. Between the 14th through 16th centuries, Luchu was the chief facilitator of a major maritime trade network stretching throughout East and Southeast Asia. Since the late 19th century, however, Luchu has been dominated by the United States and Japan. For this reason, most Luchuans today have little understanding of Luchu's impressive past as a central player in Asian maritime trade and culture. This project, created by Luchuans for Luchuans, is an attempt to repopularize Luchu history. Join us on this journey as we explore Okinawa's voyages of the South Seas. Conveniently situated at the crossroads of many different nations, Luchuans have conducted maritime trade with their neighbors since prehistoric times. In the year 1372, at the invitation of Emperor Hongwu, Luchuans sent a delegation to China formally requesting permission to pay tribute to the Ming. Luchuans greatly admired Chinese civilization, considering it to be the greatest on earth, and knew that by paying tribute it would provide many lucrative opportunities for Luchu. Envoys brought to China large quantities of native products, such as agriculture, the most important being black sugar, as well as ocean products, sulfur, limestone, textiles, and horses. In return, China gave Lu Chu many gifts such as porcelain, silk, the latest books and technology, and much more. Because China was considered the greater nation, it always gave more to Lu Chu than what it received in order to demonstrate China's immense wealth and generosity. Lu Chuans were very happy with this arrangement and sought to pay tribute to China as often as possible, which on average was once every two years. For Lu Chu, another benefit of this relationship was access to China's lucrative expanded trade network, which we often refer to as the Silk Road and Maritime Silk Road. By the 1380s, Luchuans began conducting official tribute missions in China's expanded trade network of Southeast Asian nations in an attempt to obtain luxury goods such as spices and sapinwood. Luchu would then re-export many of these items to other nations in exchange for goods such as porcelain and silk from China, books and medicine from Korea, and swords and fans from Japan. In this way, Luchuans often made hundreds or thousands of times their investment. Receiving societies were usually willing to pay exorbitant prices because these goods were in high demand and often difficult or impossible to obtain otherwise. This was a win-win trade network for everyone involved. Luchuans historically saw China as the center of the world and considered the region we now refer to as Southeast Asia, as well as Luchu itself, to be part of the South Seas, meaning the seas south of China. We know about these things via the large amount of historical records kept by Lu Chu, as well as by China and other nations. With this trade network, the Lu Chu kingdom prospered, and in the year 1458, Lu Chu's king, Shou Taiku, cast what is now known as the Bridge of Nations Bell. 
A summarized translation of the bell's inscription reads, The Luchu Kingdom is a wonderful place in the South Seas with close, intimate relations with the three nations of China, Korea, and Japan between which it is located and which express much admiration for these islands. Journeying by ship, the kingdom forms a bridge between all nations, filling its land with the precious goods and products of foreign lands. Over the course of its history, the Luchu Kingdom officially sent 17 trade missions to Korea, 19 to Japan, 110 to Southeast Asia, and 347 to China. Of course, these are only the trade missions that we know of for which there are records surviving to this day. It is possible that there were quite a few others, particularly to Southeast Asia and China. These figures only include the official trade missions sent by the Luchu Kingdom Court and do not include the informal trade that took place between private individuals or companies. Voyaging was difficult and dangerous, and the risk of disaster was high. Proper trade ships were necessary to reliably transport large quantities of goods across the ocean. China gave Lu Chu some of its own trade ships, which were the most technologically advanced in the world at the time. The Chinese eventually taught Lu Chu how to build their own Chinese-style trade ships, and even granted Lu Chu the use of shipyards and other facilities within China. Lu Chu and sailors were highly skilled, though even they were not entirely immune from being caught in an unexpected sea storm. Although rare, Lu Chu did occasionally lose a ship at sea. Of course, losing a ship meant also losing the cargo that they had worked so hard for, and possibly the lives of those on board as well. Nature was not the only threat to Lu Chu and sailors, however. The large amounts of lucrative cargo attracted pirates. Ships, therefore, needed to be well equipped to defend themselves. Between the 14th and 19th centuries, Lu Chu sent official tribute missions to China, Korea, Japan, and to several different nations in Southeast Asia. These included Siam and Patani in modern-day Thailand, Malacca in modern-day Malaysia, Annam in modern-day Vietnam, and Polities in modern-day Indonesia, Jambi, Palembang, and Aceh on the island of Sumatra, as well as ports in West Java and along the north coast. Luchuans also conducted informal trade with Luzon and Sulu in the modern-day Philippines, and possibly also Brunei. With this trade also came cross-cultural exchange. Many Southeast Asian influences can still be seen in Luchuan culture today, including in dance, clothing, cuisine, stoneworking, and other areas. This short video only touches on several centuries of trade and cultural interaction between Luchu and its neighbors, a history which I and others hope to reintroduce to a wider public audience today.